Good morning. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome everyone to today's Open Caucus. I'm Art Eagleton, Senator from Toronto, and beside me is my co-chair, Senator Raymond Saint-Germain uh, from Quebec. The Open Caucus is a forum for discussion on issues of national importance. Uh, this meeting is co-sponsored by the Independent Senators uh, Group, ISG, and the Independent Senate Liberals. This nonpartisan discussion is open to all members of Parliament, Senators, parliamentary staff, media, and the public. Today's topic, the rights of the child. The UN Declaration of the Rights of the Child in 1959 was followed by the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1989. It established that children are to be treated with dignity and respect. Well, Canada ratified that convention in 1991, thereby enshrining that all children have rights which safeguard their physical well-being. These rights are established that children have access to education, health care, and adequate standards of living. Uh, further, it asserts that children should have a voice in the decisions which impact their lives. Although Canada has made strides in implementing its obligations toward children, there are still areas where improvement uh, bus must be made. And of course, we know within our federation there are divisions of responsibilities at both the federal and provincial and also at the local levels. It is essential that action be taken to address issues such as mental health, poverty, education. Furthermore, it is necessary that attention is given to the specific barriers which indigenous and racialized minority children face. So in recognition of the UN's Universal Children's Day, in Canada's own National Child Day, which was held two days ago on Monday, we asked the question, how can Canada ensure that rights of all children are recognized and protected? Now, a couple of logistical issues. Uh, coffee is available, coffee and tea are available at the back of the room. Uh, translation is available Colleagues at the table know how that works, but for the uh, audience, it'll be channel 13 for English and channel 14 for French. Um, and we also encourage audience participation. Uh, that's what microphone number five is for. So uh, if any of you want to ask a question or make a comment at any point, you can have up to three minutes to do that. And if you do, please tell Agnes or Sarah. There, those two ladies. Uh, they just need to get your name and uh, any organization, uh, if you represent an organization, uh, let us know that as well. And we'll weave it in with uh, the questions that come from the senators uh, uh, as well. So with that, my co-chair, Raymond Saint-Germain. Merci, uh, Senator Eagleton. Thank you very much, Senator Eagleton. Now, I won't repeat all the logistics, uh, but there is coffee in the back for anyone who would care for some. And for the rest, just uh, give a hand up to Agnes or Sarah, and uh, they'll help to set you up with the questions. So, what is the status of our children today? It's true that in Canada, over the last quarter century, we've made good progress in matters of children's rights. And as has just been said, we mustn't forget that these rights are not equally accessible from coast to coast to coast, even today. Indigenous children, for example, uh, always are lacking in access to certain fundamental rights despite the fact that non-discrimination is an absolute uh, pillar of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So, we also have to ask uh, the application of our public services, the whole justice system and uh, the interest of the child, where the interest of the child is always a deciding factor, these are part of international law. We can, through our work, implement it both the spirit and the letter of the Convention of the Child. In recognizing the scope of the work yet to be done, as was done by my colleagues recently, particularly Senators O, Jaffer, Dupuis, and several others, and Soupe as well, who is with us this morning, I hope this presentation this morning, we will have a pivotal moment here, which will aid 
aid us in guiding us in our legislative duties and to provide us with a wider perspective to our children and their rights. This morning, uh, who will have different perspectives uh, on uh, the issue of the rights of the child. Um, I'd ask them to try to keep to about seven minutes each because we have one more of the panelists than we usually have and we have a tight time frame. We have to be out of here at 11.15 because there's other meetings that are occurring. So, uh, let me introduce our first uh, speaker, who for my colleagues, most of my colleagues, doesn't need uh, a long introduction because uh, she was one of us uh, not, not all that many years ago. Um, so the Honorable Landon... I remember. <laughs> <laughs> True. The Honorable Landon Pearson uh, is a longtime advocate for the rights uh, and well-being of children. From 1994 to 205, uh, she served in the Senate of Canada where she became known as the Senator for Children. In May of 96, uh, she was named advisor on children's rights to the <coughs> Minister of Foreign Affairs. And in 1998, she became the personal representative of the Prime Minister to the 2002 United Nations Special Session on Children. Upon her retirement from the Senate in 2005, Landon Pearson um, moved over uh, her efforts uh, to Carleton University where she directs the Landon Pearson Resource Center. Welcome, Senator Pearson. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Merci beaucoup et uh, bienvenue à tout le monde. Je suis très content d'être. Thank you very much and welcome to all. Uh, when we meet in a room that I'm very familiar with, uh, I want to thank my colleagues, my former colleague, Serge Royal, for everything that he's done uh, to uh, make this a beautiful room, in fact. Uh, all these artifacts. Uh, Mine is more a call for action. You may get more details from the others about problems. I'm going to t tell you about what you can do. Now. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> we have in my at my center in, in at Carleton. We issue a, a journal every year. We're just about to issue tomorrow the most uh, recent issue of our journal, uh, which is number four which has the theme of children's rights are human rights. And it's a really important theme. I can remember being at Beijing on behalf of the Senate uh, when, when uh, Hillary Clinton got up and said, women's rights are human rights, as if that were breaking news. <laughs> well, I'm giving some more breaking news. <laughs> children's rights are human rights. <laughs> and. But uh, the important thing to remember about human rights is that all human rights are relational. They're really about how we have to respect one another. And that children's rights are human rights, but they're human rights plus. That is, they have all the same rights that adults have, but they have, well, not, the, I mean, they have, from a human, but the human rights perspective, they don't have the right to uh, drive. Uh, they don't have the right well, at 16 they do, but, anyway. <laughs> but they 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 um, they have the civil and political rights, and and uh, as you just mentioned, then cultural and, and social and economic rights all put together in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And <clears throat> but they also have rights plus, and the rights plus the plus are the things that children need because they're vulnerable. So the rights to protection are much stronger for children than they are for adults, generally speaking, and the rights of provision, education, and so on, uh, best possible health care are, are pluses for, for children. We all recognize that. We all recognize that children need extra, extra support from adults. But the basic message about being uh, children's rights being human rights is that children are rights holders, and the rest of us are duty bearers. So I'm talking to you now as duty bearers. I think, don't think there's anyone actually here under the age of 18. So <laughs> we are all duty bearers. And I honestly believe that the more power you have as an individual, the greater your responsibility as a duty, as a duty bearer. 
So the role of the Senate, as I learned quickly when I came here, is one of the roles of the Senate. A very important role of the Senate is the defense of minorities. And children are in a minority. They are a minority population. And so when I was asked to represent children in the Senate, which is what I was asked, although technically I was Ontario, but uh, I was, that was the call I was given. Um, I took that up because I found, and this is why I'm talking to my fellow senators, you have a lot of opportunities here. I, I, it took me a little while to figure out how much was going to be possible, uh, but then I tried to take full advantage <laughs> of what was possible. Um, I was able to sit on, uh, you know, the committees that I sat on, the, the, um, the uh, uh, legal and constitutional, as, uh, as Senator, some senators will remember, Yael Sarish in particular, and others <laughs> remember, but I was able to sponsor the legislation that affected children. So that was the Youth Criminal Justice Act, which everybody will remember, and, and uh, I was engaged with uh, our late and lamented Thelma Shalifu in the, on the Aboriginal Peoples Committee with uh, the study on urban Aboriginal youth, which is actually an excellent study that, that, that uh, we had a very good report from that. I had, I think the most challenging opportunity I had was co-chairing the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Child Custody and Access, which was about children, although most of the witnesses were angry adults, or a lot of the witnesses were angry adults. Um, I was uh, the co-chair, the, the vice chair of the Human Rights Committee when we did the study on the implementation of the, of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and <clears throat> found that we were not doing a very good job with the report that came out called the Silent Citizens. But we did it in two reports. The first one I was more responsible for, which was, who's in charge here? The second one was children, the silent citizens. These are all extraordinary opportunities that you as senators have to engage in all these kinds of activities. Um, I was also able to do a regular report uh, out of my Senate office on children and the Hill, which we recorded all kinds of government policies as well as legislation that was happening uh, two or three times a year. I published that over a number of years. Uh, mainly for the sort of stakeholders out there and the who were interested and wanted to know what was going on. Um, it was, you know, all those things the Senate makes possible for you. You have powers. What I did, which was perhaps the thing I'm most proud of, uh, quite aside from being the advisor on children's rights and the opportunity to take part in the, the, um, the uh, international field on children's rights, uh, particularly with respect to, well, child labor, uh, children in armed conflict, which, of course, Senator uh, uh, Romeo Dallaire uh, was involved with him both while he, before he came, when he was here, and still. Um, and uh, But the sexual exploitation, and I was able to, with the uh, capacity of the Senate, to set up a standing committee, not a standing committee, a ad hoc committee to look at the, the uh, sexual exploitation of children, and we were able to move the agenda, keep the issue on the agenda from the time in Stockholm when we had that quarter, when that first burst onto the scene as a big issue. <clears throat> and the important thing there is that we were able to bring experiential youth into the Senate who could speak to their own experience. And that was something that makes you understand that the opportunity to hear what the young people themselves have is extremely important. So that was my, my, my final comment that I wanted to make is that in the Youth Criminal Justice Act, I worked with the Department of Justice to make sure that young people who had been in custody were being heard from. On the, uh, uh, the other things, when we did the custody and access, we made all the, put the things, not to put kids in a place where they had to make some kind of choice or reveal anything unpleasant, but we did put in everything, so there were the translators and everything else, and the kids made a huge contribution to that 
report that we developed. Um, we were able to embed in the reports that I was involved with all the references necessary to the Convention on the Rights of the Child into the, it's in the preamble of the uh, Youth Criminal Justice Act um, because this is the way you get the convention embedded into Canadian law. It's through the law and through references through the law and through Supreme Court judgments in the end and so on. Um, having young people here, some of you may remember, I think the term 17 when we discussed the changing over the um, school system in Newfoundland. It was a constitutional amendment. We made sure that we heard from some of the kids who were being affected by that change. Not that they really disagreed completely with their parents, but never mind, they were being heard. They were heard when we did our study on the implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child in, from the Human Rights Committee. It's possible you have to keep thinking about it. So this is my call out to you. You have a lot of capacity to make a difference. So just keep at it, keep thinking of it, don't forget it. Every opportunity you have, bring, bring the voice of children in one way or another, sometimes in person, sometimes through correspondence, but bringing in, giving them the right to be heard and to be paid attention to. So that's my comment to you. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Très intéressant, merci. Uh, plaisir de vous présenter maintenant. Thank you. It was very interesting. I'd like to introduce you now to Mr. Erwin Elman, who uh, was appointed uh, the head of the new provincial advisor office uh, in Ontario by an all-party uh, panel. He has an extensive experience as a counselor, educator, youth worker, program manager, policy developer and uh, a, def a defender, an advocate for child and youth ad rights. For over 20 years, uh, he's been the manager of PAPE Adolescent Resource Centre in Toronto. It's a program of the Children's Aid Society of Toronto and the Catholic Children's Aid Society of Toronto as well. More recently, he was the director of client services at uh, Central Toronto Youth Centres. It's a very innovative uh, children's mental health center. So, Mr. Elman, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's um, an honor to be here and to be asked to speak. Oh, I want to acknowledge I'm on uh, traditional lands, unceded lands of Algonquin people. I want to say thank you to um, the panelists. It's, it's an equal honor to be with Landon. Uh, Senator Pearson, I still call her Senator Pearson. Um, in many ways, I think, like Landon, when eventually we figure out in Canada what a commission or a children's commissioner will look like, and I think that's a, a big discussion we have, but it's inevitable that it's going to happen. Landon will be seen as the unofficial first national commission commissioner, I think, and uh, we were a debt. Uh, gratitude for everything she's done to get us this far and as you can see pushing us to keep going <laughs> me too she pushes me too thank you for that um i just finished a listening tour that i do every year around the national child day and i go around the province and spend uh, i spent 10 days just going to speak not speak to listen to children in my mandate. So I would go to youth justice uh, facilities, group homes, drop-in centers for street-involved youth. I was at a First Nation Youth Council meetings, um, mental health summit, uh, which you'll, you may hear about, listening to young people, hundreds of young people over the 10 days. I can tell you that the rights that come seemingly so easily to some children and youth in the, the province, and I would say the country, are very hard fought if afforded at all to many children in the country. Much, many more children do not see their rights afforded to them than we want to think. Um, that's the truth. I've heard it. I want to say 
we can make no mistake that in every indicator you could think of, every right you could think of, every lived experience you can think of that tells us that these children are not being afforded their rights. Every one of those indicators, there's a gap between the promise of the convention, promise of policy and legislation, but certainly the convention and the lived experience of children. There's no greater gap. In fact, it's a chasm in my estimation for Indigenous children in the country and in the, my province. Uh, they're at the, the top in terms of those who do not see their rights realized. It's clear, and I think it needs to be said. I want to say two themes in the couple minutes I have left that I've heard. The first was echoed by one of the young people. I met with 90 young people who were struggling with uh, mental health issues, and they came together uh, with Children's Mental Health Ontario at a summit, call it the New Mentality, and was happy to be there for a day with them and listening. And, and there, one of the young people said, we are doing our best to create change. But the burden of change cannot be on us alone. We need some adult help. I remember her saying that, <laughs> we need some adult help. And I was remembering that we talk about in, maybe not senators, but we talk about this wor these words, youth engagement. And it's not youth who need to be engaged, not in all these places, not in youth custody, not in group homes, not in a mental health system, not indigenous young people, it's adults who need to be engaged. It's so the actual problem is adult engagement, not youth engagement. They're ready. I, I would tell you that, and that's a theme, no matter where I went. I was in a, a youth justice facility and I'm listening to this young man who says, uh, once you're in the system, you're, you're trapped. It's really hard to get out. And he's saying, you know, when I do get out, part of the problem is I got nobody. I'm going to nothing, nobody. And I'm thinking, what a difficult situation, a hopeless. But his next sentence is, I want to change the way this custody facility works. Like, no matter what situation I'm meeting young people find themselves in, they want to be an agent of change. They have ideas about what could be different. It's not necessary in policy that senators might, the way they might talk about it, or even in terms of the, their rights. Of course, they're interested in their rights, but they'll talk about, this is what I need changed for me. And it's about realizing the right. And they want to be part of that process of change. It's actually remarkable, remarkable, that they have that much strength to do that. I, I'm, I'm now thinking about a 10-year-old at a 10-year-old at a youth council meeting in a, a friendship center in, in Thunder Bay who was talking about how he has a, a friend that's um, LGBT um, and it's his job, he thinks, to support that friend at school. 10-year-old wanting to make change. I'm saying to the senators and to, to the adults listening, it's you who need to engage with these young people. I mean, that's making all of their rights realized, but certainly making the right to participate realized. The second theme, and it's connected, I think, is that it revolves around belonging. That's, I guess, the best way to put it. The further children felt separated from their family, and I'm going to use family in quotation marks because many of the young people I met and children I met describe family in a variety of ways. It's not always their blood. Sometimes it's their teacher. In fact, I do remember a young person saying, my teacher was, I really get along with them. I consider them family. So for children and youth, the more they're separated from a sense of family, the more they're separated from the services that they receive, not feeling safe and comfortable, the more they're separated from their schools, the more they're separated from an organization, a service or a club, 
the more they don't have those things, the more I think lost they feel, the more isolated they talk about feeling, the more voiceless they are, and in fact, young people talk about being invisible. There's nothing, in my estimation, more debilitating to a human being than invisibility. Nothing. Yet these children that I'm meeting feel invisible, and invisible to them means nobody gives a damn. That's where hopelessness comes from. I remember a quote by Jean Vanier, and I hope I have it right. Otherwise, I'm going to say I'm paraphrasing. He said, we think our greatest need is to be loved, but actually our most fundamental need is to belong. And I think that is true. And then I'm thinking, and this is the last thing I'll, I'll add, I think about an Indigenous youth group I met at a drop-in center in Toronto. M many of the, the young people were street involved. And frankly, you know, yes, they should be here. And I have a vision of the Senate, and I'd love to work with you about exactly what Landon said. How do the voices of these children engage with you? And how do you engage with them? How do they find themselves in? This, frankly, would not be a meeting where the 30 Indigenous young people I'm talking about would feel comfortable and safe. So how do we create a place and a space for you to engage with them? It's possible. I would love to work with you about how to do that, whether it's individually or another meeting. How do they have a place here? So this, this group, I thought, said they felt separated from their cu culture, their identity. They talked. They, it's amazing that they, they knew about residential schools and the legacy and the TRC, and they said it speaks to them. And part of understanding them is about understanding their history. And they said to me, I was there, you need to learn more about our history so you can understand us. And then they said, and we need to learn more about our history so we can understand ourselves. And we don't. And we need it, because that's part of the belonging. And then they said, you know, this, this young woman, again, a young woman said, I think for many of us, services, family, even our communities turned their back on us because of our mental health and addictions. And we have nobody and nothing. And I asked her, where is the hope, if any, that you can find? And she said, the hope is in each other. It's in the community that we've been able to create, because we are all we have. I thought, that's a strong, powerful statement. It's a powerful source of hope. It is not good enough for those children, for any children. And that's a, a common theme across the young people I've met with. And I think we can do better. I think there's a role for the Senate to be part of demonstrating to Canadians how we can do better by bringing them in, by finding ways to allow yourselves to engage with them so that you can work with them to create change. That will be making the convention something real for Canada and, and in this building. So I thank you for the, the time. Well, thank you. Some very vital and powerful thoughts uh, you've given us uh, and uh, born out of your many years of experience on the front lines and talking with many different children. Thank you for that. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Sybil Sissak. I don't know if I've got that right. Uh, who is Director of Public Policy at Children's Mental Health Ontario. For nearly 15 years, Sybil has been advocating for policy change on a range of social justice issues across nonprofit government and multilateral uh, environments. Uh, she's contributed to the establishment uh, of uh, full day kindergarten and childcare reform throughout Ontario <coughs> with the Ministry of Education. At the Children's and Mental Health Ontario, 
Uh, she's director of public policy. She works to understand complex and uh, systemic challenges facing the children's mental health sector and to develop and lead practical solutions to improve the health and well-being of children, youth, and their families. Sybil? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, senators, honorable members, and fellow panelists. I'm actually quite thrilled to be sitting here amongst all of you. The question before us today is how can Canada ensure that the rights of all children are protected? And I think uh, when it comes to children's mental health, right out of the gate, we have a problem. Certainly, we've committed to upholding the principles of the UNCRC, but unlike education and healthcare, um, I'm not aware of any legislation in Canada uh, that guarantees the right of children and youth uh, to access mental health treatment. Instead, what we have is a two-tiered system. So the families that can afford to pay for private therapy simply pay for it. And the families that can't generally depend on our public system, which has been vastly underfunded for decades. In Ontario, community-based children's mental health treatment providers have not had a base funding increase in nearly two decades. And when you overlay the cost of inflation, we are almost 50% behind where we should be. And when you further overlay the surge in demand that we're seeing, it's even more evident that we're failing kids. So collectively, we've all done a great job to reduce stigma surrounding mental illness but we've not increased the capacity of services to meet the increased need. And we're seeing the impacts of this. After accidents, suicide is the leading cause of death for young people in our country. UNICEF reported earlier this year that Canada has the seventh highest rate of suicide in the developed world, and that's even higher than the United States. One in five young people in Canada will experience a mental health issue, and UNICEF's recent report actually puts that figure closer to one in four. Children's Mental Health Ontario estimates there are more than 12,000 children and youth in Ontario waiting up to a year for counseling and therapy at community-based, publicly funded centres. And with a demand increase of approximately 10% per year, these numbers continue to grow. In some cases, kids are waiting an unacceptable 18 months or more. And while children wait, of course we know they deteriorate. A recent Ipsos survey found that more than 30% of youth had missed school due to anxiety and about one-fourth of parents had to take time off work to help them. And this leads to dropouts and job loss. <clears throat> Kids left waiting for treatment also end up in crisis in our emergency departments. Data from the Canadian Institute for Health Information show a 56% increase in emergency department visits and a 47% increase in emergency in hospital admissions for youth with mental health issues since 2006. And this is at a time when youth hospital visits for all other issues fell by 18%. So hospitals, as you can imagine, are not the best place for kids to get long-term support for their mental health needs. So they play a crucial role when it comes to acute stabilization, but these youth typically need cognitive behavioral therapy and other forms of psychotherapy that community-based children's mental health centers can provide. The situation is particularly concerning in the North, where treatment services are vastly lacking. The Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences reports that suicide rates are highest in Northern Ontario, as much as 10 times higher than the provincial average, and they've doubled since 2009. We know remoteness is a huge challenge in these communities. Um, when Indigenous youth in the North cannot access the treatment they require, it's actually common practice for them to be separated from their families and sent away from home to obtain treatment in more urban locations in a residential setting. And we've just heard um, from Irwin how disempowering it can be uh, to feel as though you don't have a sense of belonging. And there are very serious cultural implications to this practice that draw parallels with the cultural injustices of residential schooling. And what's more, it doesn't take into account the research which indicates that a family-centered approach is best. And we're also not doing enough to protect children in the child welfare system who by very definition have mental health needs as a result of the trauma they've experienced. Even when we know they've experienced trauma, abuse, neglect, family addiction issues and more, we are waiting too long to provide them with the right level of need, with the right level of treatment. So how can Canada ensure that children are getting the mental health treatment and support they require? Well, I think there's three key things that we can do. The first is we need to invest in our public mental health system to ensure that no child waits more than 30 days for treatment. And within this, there are several goals we can work towards. We can ensure that treatment is provided close to home, so kids can recover with support of their family, caregivers, and communities. 
we need to ensure that treatment is appropriate to their needs. And so this includes their needs related to culture, race, gender, sexual orientation, and in the language of their choice when we can do it. We need to ensure that public providers are resourced properly so they can hire well-trained professional staff, including the right interdisciplinary teams that include social work, psychology, and access to psychiatry. And we need to ensure that service providers are equipped to collect data, so they, uh, and the data needs to be able to be disaggregated, shared, and studied. The second thing we can do is take deliberate action to consider high-risk children when we're designing policies and interventions. And this includes children in care, indigenous children, children living in poverty, and children who have experienced trauma. And finally, we need to commit to prevention and early intervention. And this is not to say, of course, that all mental health problems are preventable because we know that's not the case. But for those kids that we know are particularly high risk, we need to intervene early to surround them with protective factors that can help change their life trajectory. And although Canada is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, we invest less in children than other developed countries, and this is wrong. Universal early childhood education is one of the best ways to level the playing field at a very early age by providing a supportive and stimulating environment for all kids. It also ensures that well-trained ECEs and other professionals can identify kids who may be at risk early on in life so that they and their families can be referred for specialized services as early as possible. I really want to thank the committee for being so open to hearing this advice today. I really appreciate your attention to these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to introduce you uh, to our next speaker, Marc Saint-Denis. Uh, Marc is a uh, Métis. He, he comes from the Red River area. He holds a uh, degree. And he, just depending on looking at the linkages between the indigenous world and the, the issues that are arising now in Canada. Mark is a primary, uh, he's a speaker and facilitator. He's spoken of all ages and background, uh, history, realities of colo colonialism in Canada, and the many ways that we can all positively impact the lives of Indigenous children and youth. Mark is a primary contact for the Touchstones of Hope movement as well as the coordinating editor of the First People's Child and Family Review, as well as the uh, quarterly newsletter of the uh, Caring Society. So, Mark, we're waiting with anticipation to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. I would like to begin by offering thanks and acknowledging the Algonquin people whose land, unceded, unsurrendered land, we are gathered on today. So, as I was introduced, my name is Mark St. Dennis, and I am Red River Métis from Manitoba and I work with the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada. For those who don't know, the Caring Society works to ensure the safety and well-being of First Nations youth and their families through education initiatives, public policy campaigns, and providing quality resources to support communities. Using a reconciliation framework that addresses contemporary hardships for Indigenous families in ways that uplift all Canadians, the Caring Society champions culturally-based equity for First Nations children and their families so that they can grow up safely at home, get a good education, and be healthy and proud of who they are. In a landmark ruling released in January 2016, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, a legal institution whose mandate is to protect the human rights of all people in Canada, found that the Canadian government is racially discriminating against 165,000 First Nations children and their families. Provincial child welfare laws apply on reserves, but the federal government is responsible to pay for these services. It is an established fact that the federal government does not provide equitable funding for First Nations child welfare services, resulting in a two-tiered system of government service delivery where First Nations children get less. The Canadian Human Rights Tribunal found that the provision of the First Nations Child and Family Services Program and its related funding models and agreements by the Department 
of Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada is contrary to Section 5 of the Canadian Human Rights Act. In addition, the Tribunal found that Canada's failure to ensure First Nations children can access public services via Jordan's principle was discriminatory and contrary to the law. Jordan's principle is meant to ensure that all First Nations children receive the services they need in a way that is reflective of their distinct cultural needs, takes full account of the historical disadvantage linked to colonization, and without experiencing any service denials, delays, or disruptions. <clears throat> Canada has done little to remedy this situation, despite the fact that it has known for decades about the inequities of the First Nations child welfare programming and the negative impacts that this has had on First Nations children. In the year and a half that followed the 2016 decision, the Tribunal has issued three remedial non-compliance orders against Canada, most recently in May 2017, for its failure to adhere to the rulings on First Nations child welfare and Jordan's principle. A fourth non-compliance order is expected shortly. The Caring Society does recognize the progress that is made, in particular by Health Canada, in regards to the implementation of Jordan's principle. However, the Canadian government remains in clear opposition of the tribunal's <coughs> orders and it continues to litigate against First Nations families seeking services for their children. It is our experience at the Caring Society that governments do not create change. Governments respond to change. As individuals living in Canada, it is our collective responsibility to tell the government that there is no excuse for any form of discrimination in Canada, especially discrimination that directly harms children and youth. No person should ever have to recover from their childhood. That is why the Caring Society has launched the Spirit Bear Plan. So Spirit Bear, unfortunately I wasn't able to bring him with me today, um, probably because he wouldn't have made it through security, but uh, Spirit Bear is a special member of the Caring Society. Uh, he's a teddy bear and was gifted to us uh, 10 years ago. And he has been a witness to all of the hearings related to the Canadian human rights case on First Nations children. He represents the thousands of young people across Canada who stood up for the health, safety, and well-being of First Nations children. And he has a plan to end the inequities faced by many First Nations families. So Spirit Bear calls on Canada to immediately comply with all rulings by the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, ordering it to immediately <coughs> cease its discriminatory funding of First Nations child and family services. The order further requires Canada to fully and properly implement Jordan's principle. Spirit Bear calls on Parliament to ask the Parliamentary Budget Officer to publicly cost out the shortfalls in all federally funded public services provided to First Nations children, youth, and families. This includes things like health care, health, water, child welfare, etc. And propose solutions to fix these inequities. Spirit Bear calls on government to consult with First Nations to co-create a holistic Spirit Bear plan to end all of the inequalities with dates and confirmed investments in a short period of time sensitive to children's best interests development and distinct community needs. Spirit Bear calls on government departments providing services to First Nations children and families to undergo a thorough and independent 360 degree evaluation to identify any ongoing discriminatory ideologies, policies or practices and address them. These evaluations must be publicly available. Finally, Spirit Bear calls on all public servants including those at senior level, to receive mandatory training to identify and address government ideology, policies and practices that fetter the implementation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. There is no excuse for racial discrimination against children. It is our responsibility to ensure that future generations of First Nations, Métis and Inuit do not have to recover from their childhood and that future generations of non-Indigenous people never have to say sorry. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, very clear and precise in your comments. And I hope you've got more of these to pass yeah. out, uh, yes, uh, which lists the spirit uh, bear plan.
Well, our fifth uh, uh, speaker is Lisa Wolf. Uh, she is Director Policy and Research at UNICEF Canada. <coughs> she leverages UNICEF's global strengths, including data and innovation, and works with many Canadian partners to advance the rights of Canada's children. Lisa is a member of the Advocacy Task Force for UNICEF internationally. She has represented UNICEF Canada in various regional and global forums, including UN Special Session on Children and the Yokohama and Rio Congresses Against Sexual Exploitation of Children. She convened the North America Regional Consultation for the UN Study on Violence Against Children. Uh, Lisa is a member of the Board of Directors of PrevNet and the Canadian Coalition for Rights of the Child. And she's going to use slides, so I bring your attention to the various monitors. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'd like to begin all, also by acknowledging uh, that we're gathered on the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. And um, delighted that the Senate Open Caucus is taking an opportunity to focus on children and youth. I think it's the first time that you've done that. and. Um, you know, I've, I've titled the, the presentation, How Are the Children? Because that is a question that is central um, to many societies and cultures. And if we can do more of that here, I, you know, I hope this is the first of many opportunities to focus on children and youth. Um, then I think, you know, we can um, contribute to, to progress for children's rights. And uh, the key question that you know, we've been asked to explore today is, is, of course, how can Canada ensure that the rights of all children are recognized and protected? And understanding how we're making progress in human rights is generally a pretty subjective exercise. And, um, you know, we have a lot of really good qualitative policy analysis available to help us understand that um, from the Canadian Coalition for the Rights of Children, um, from other organizations, we can get closer to objective measures of some of the enabling conditions that we're putting in place um, to realize rights. Uh, we can look at how well we're uh, responding to the recommendations of the UN committee um, after you know, successive Canadian reviews. We can look at how well we're implementing the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal um, orders. Um, but one of the things we can also do is really look at the outcomes, um, the measurable outcomes in our children's lives that describe um, how they are doing. And really, that is um, what we consider to be the ultimate realization of rights, is how our kids are living their lives and how well they're doing. And 14 UNICEF report cards over 17 years have shed some light on, on that question, how our kids are doing. And, um, you know, really the, the comparative analyses that these different report cards um, present is, are, are really all to answer the question, why are countries with similar resources and capacities achieving such different outcomes for their kids? And what can we learn from that? You know, it's not about um, shaming Canada or um, pointing to, you know, our weaknesses because every country has strengths that, that we can learn from and build on and um, weaknesses where it really, you know, is probably the better place to focus and, and do better on. Um, so, you know, what these report cards tend to do and what the data do is ask us to ask better questions about how are our children. And we may not all agree on the answers, but at least asking the questions takes a lot of courage. Um, and so that's where I'm going to ask you to go today. And I'm showing some slides just because working with a bit of data, um, it helps to show you some pictures, or at least helps to show me pictures. So let's see if I can actually move the slides. I'm not sure if I can. Oh, did I do something wrong, Agnes, with the setup here? Ah, okay. So I'm, I'm going to focus on our latest report card because uh, it, it shares some of the most current uh, data we have to describe um, some aspects of how well we're realizing children's rights in the daily lived lives uh, of, our ch of our kids. And um, the, the latest report card that came out earlier this year presents an index of child well-being that um, is 
aligned in, in the data that we're using to the sustainable development goals. And we don't have uh, agreed measurable outcomes for children's rights. Well, we have some, um, but what governments have done is actually agreed to uh, 17 goals, 169 targets, bless you, and um, all of them are measurable for the sustainable development goals, and we're supposed to realize these by 2030. So the goals, um, and where children live in these goals, um, really you know, don't fully describe all of the, um, the richness of the rights that are in the convention. I do wish we had more measurable um, rights for children. Um, but you know, really in Canada at the moment, there is no plan B that our government has agreed to in terms of a children's agenda. So um, what UNICEF has done is, um, oh gosh, I messed this up again. Sorry. Yeah, I'm getting help. There we go. Um, we have focused on the, uh, the sustainable development goals that are most relevant to children and, and particularly in high income country contexts. And embedded in these different uh, goals, you will find um, children's rights, rights to health, to nutrition, to protection from violence, to an adequate standard of living. Um, again, there's some pretty fundamental um, rights that, that we can measure. We can't measure everything that's important to measure. Um, but what we see is that children are really a sensitive indicator species of how well our society is doing for its people, um, how well we're sharing prosperity, and how well we're uh, protecting our environment. And when we take 22 indicators to measure these different goals, um, what we have done is compiled that into a composite index and we find that Canada is in the middle of 41 uh, wealthiest countries in the world. We ranked uh, 25th out of 41 countries. Um, and when we look, oh boy, this has gone again. Yeah. Um, it might not surprise too many of you, because you've probably heard this before, uh, that the Nordic countries tend to sustain you know, better and more equitable outcomes for children in more areas of their lives. So they're kind of stuck at the top of uh, the different indices of child and youth well-being. We've had five iterations of them in 10 years. Um, but um, being stuck at the top or stuck in the middle, as Canada has been, you know, isn't um, immutable. We've seen countries like Germany uh, make their way up league tables over time, um, countries like Japan. Um, in 2007, when we had our first index come out, the UK was um, at the bottom of the wealthy countries and they've made progress over time, um, moving at that time from a, a ranking of 21 in the composite index up to 13. So making progress is possible and that is, I think, a really actually exciting message. Um, I just want to show you a little bit about what we learned about Canada in the latest uh, iteration of this index because you'll see a profile like this for every country. Every country has areas of relative achievement, um, areas where we're doing well for kids and we have areas where we're kind of in the middle and areas where we're lagging behind other countries and um, I think it's celebratory that Canada, you know, despite the challenges that children tell us about in experiencing public education, um, Canada's really sustained a, a high performing and equitable system. A lot of kids succeed and they do so pretty equitably in our country and that's where a lot of those green indicators are. And I think that's because Canadians agree we can have a strong universal public uh, system for children. We put a great deal of priority on education, and look what we can do when we do that kind of thing. Um, where we are lagging behind is, uh, sorry if I can just go back to that, is, um, is really concerning. And what we see is a, a profile in Canada of falling behind, farthest behind our peers in certain aspects of children's health and in the levels of violence they experience. And Sybil referred to the fact that rates of um, adolescent suicide in Canada are relatively very high, um, as is the child homicide rate. Um, children account for half of all of the homicides in Canada. That is extremely disproportionate and it's unacceptable. Um, 
But these are relatively rare forms of violence. Um, more prevalent are forms like bullying, where um, we have 15% of kids report that they experience chronic bullying. Um, and also towards the bottom of these indicators, you'll find that um, the relative income poverty rate for children is, is fairly high, one in five uh, children. And you would have seen Campaign 2000's report card come out yesterday with a lot more detail about that. And that's linked to some of the, the indicators you see at the bottom too, around higher food insecurity, um, obesity, and infant mortality. All of these are linked to poverty. Um, if you're not that interested in international comparisons, um, you know, we can look at how we're making progress within Canada over time. And um, again, you know, over the last uh, 25 plus years since we ratified the convention, the general trend has been to make progress in children's indicators. What we're seeing though with the last report card is a slowing down. Um, and it, of those 22 indicators we measured, only seven improved in the last decade and more stayed the same or got worse. On the other hand, uh, GDP has continued to rise. That curve is a strong um, upward curve um, and children's indicators have been fairly flat. And so we ask, you know, among all of that wealth accumulation, really where are the dividends for our kids? And why aren't we seeing the momentum in child and youth well-being? Well, we have some answers to that question from, um, again, 17 years of looking at how Canada is doing for kids in measurable ways and how we compare to other countries, uh, supported by a lot of other research within Canada and internationally. And there, this chart is, um, I think, offers a very striking observation. Um, what it tells us is that countries in the top right corner of this scatter graph who have more broad income inequality guess what, they have great outcomes for kids and those outcomes are more equitable. So more kids are doing better and fewer kids are falling behind. Countries um, that are in the middle like Canada with moderate income inequality have moderate outcomes for kids and less fairness and so on. And so, you know, this is telling us that we have a, a bigger problem um, than the, the challenges of our very marginalized groups of children. This is a broader societal issue. We've had a lot of debate about income inequality in Canada. Do we have it? You know, if we have it, is it a problem? If it's a problem, can we do something about it? I think what our data is telling us is that, yes, it's a problem for kids, <laughs> and it's helping to explain why it's so difficult to um, make progress. And so, um, it also, it, it, there's a, a research uh, starting to show us that countries that are more unequal have this profile that we see in Canada of having some worse health and violence outcomes. And we're not really sure yet why, but you know, it may well be that inequality is trickling down to children in um, a more competitive society, a more individualistic society with more stress and more difficult relationships. Um, so again, this affects children broadly and it makes life harder at the margins. Uh, and so, what can we do about this? This is a, uh, a comic that appeared in the UK Guardian in 2007 when, again, our first index came out and the UK was at the bottom, and they didn't shy away from it. You know, it caused a lot of public debate and um, government debate, and um, they did something about it. And they did things that countries who are consistently the best performers for kids when you look at these different outcomes do and what Canada is starting to do more of. And it's not a magic equation, you know, the, the secret sauce again is leaning on broad income inequality. And there's different policy levers to do that and you know the, the greater investments in the Canada Child Benefit, um, some of the recommendations from Campaign 2000, um, an agenda for um, gender equality, all of these things you know, are shown to actually help tackle broad income inequality and of course addressing reconciliation is going to be part of that. Um, the second key thing that we're finding is that we do, um, as we heard from other speakers, need to invest earlier in our kids where, where inequality first shows up and it shows up before they start school and it tends to accumulate. And, <coughs> You know, Canada tends to invest a lot more in remedial programs later than investing early 
um, when we can really make a difference and also tackle inequality. So these two things work really well together. So that means more, you know, if we can, if we can take what we learned about how well we produce good educational outcomes, we do that through a strong universal public progressive system available to all kids because it's really tough to target services. If we did that more for early child development, early child care, um, we'd be doing so much better uh, according to the evidence. And then, and, and then as you've heard from other speakers, putting children and youth squarely centrally in our governance so we can ask how are the kids every time we're making decisions. And there's no policy neutral decision when it comes to kids. So having a children's commissioner or commission, um, doing child rights impact assessment, assessments, you know, systematic ways to pay attention to kids in decision making. All of these things, there are three key things we can do. Um, we've turn, we're turning the ship, if we can do more of these, you know, we'll be moving up those league tables as well and our kids will be living better lives. So thanks very much. Thank you. Well, the panel is, uh, the panelists have set the stage uh, for questions and uh, comments. Uh, and uh, we have some senators down. I also have a couple of people from the audience. Uh, again, I draw your attention to Agnes and to Sarah. If you want to get on the list, we'll do our best. We've got just about an hour left. And first speaker is Senator Munson. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, very much. And I want to thank the panelists uh, for your contributions and what you do each and every day. Uh, on the front lines for Canada's children and for children around the world. We had a National Child Day celebration in the Senate yesterday. We had four to 500 children, children talking to children. We had a breakfast this morning where we had advocacy groups from across this country and some are here who are on the front lines again doing, and we're all, we're in this together, obviously. We're the converted, we believe it, we believe in our children. I was struck by Erwin Elman's comment about Indigenous ch children when he said the hope is in each other. But there's got to be more, much more than that. So the question I have for you, it's on the National Children's Commissioner and what you just mentioned, Ms. Wolf. Uh, there is an elephant in the room. The elephant is not here. The elephant is the government. Past governments, for the last 20 years, and I get very frustrated, and I'm sure Senator Pearson feels the same way. It's wonderful to have these good, strong reports everywhere sitting out there, the silent citizens and talking about children's rights and saying we need a national commissioner. And it was said here this morning, it is inevitable it's going to be done. I'm not so sure about that because every government has looked at it and said, oh yes, we're empathetic, here's what we can do and so on and so forth. Well, somebody in this government has to take charge and has to stand up, he or she, and say, Yes, we'll do it. You know, it's worked in the United Kingdom. Why can't it work here? I mean, they talk about borders and provincial jurisdictions and so on. Well, there are no borders for children. So and the question is for, for me, and I'm sorry to get passionate about it, what will it take to move this government to get it over the top? And anybody can answer. <laughs> okay. Well, they've all got the answer to that. <laughs> we're, we're awaiting the answer. Well, Erwin, you were mentioned. Uh, <laughs> so I'll... <laughs> Why don't you go first? And if anybody else wants to come in. Uh, well, I mean, it's a, so, so the whole issue of uh, national commissioners is interesting to me. I'm a bit of an outlier in how I think about it, although the reason I, you know, I think, I, I said it's inevitable because it feels like uh, when I first became an advocate 10 years ago, everybody was saying national commissioner, national commissioner, and nobody really took that discussion seriously. And it's only in recent times where people are beginning to say, oh, okay, now what would a national commissioner mean to indigenous people? Is it a, is it a commissioner? Is it a council? Is it, what is it? And those discussions, I know in, in the background are starting to happen. I think that's important. I know there's other jurisdictions that are starting to, to think about well, what would it mean to Quebec? What would a national body that represents children be? What would a uniquely Canadian version of something that represents a voice for children be? And people are starting to talk about it more and there's debate surfacing that never happened before because frankly, I think nobody actually ever thought it was gonna come to be. And now I think people are saying, okay, 
what that could what could that look like um, I think sometimes it's a little self-serving for an advocate to say, oh, you need another one of me and everything will be fine, right? Because everything hasn't been fine just because we have an advocate. And that's the outlier piece of I have is that I, um, you know, I don't think we should pin our hopes on any commission, commissioner, system to represent children's voice. Very important that it will solve everything. I think... <coughs> Uh, frankly, I remember when the rapporteur from the last UN report came, you know, Canada uh, gave a report to the UN on how we're doing with the convention. Next one's coming this summer. I certainly hope young people's voices are represented. It's not been, it's not happened before. Um, and the rapporteur came to Canada after the report, and she said to to people she met, "Commission is really important, but also you need a set of." legal rights for the commission to hold itself, the government, Canada, accountable to. Otherwise, you're still stuck in just the voice and not the action. And I, I think that's important to have a discussion about. I don't know what it will take to move a government, although I do know that when young people come to the Senate, when you figure out how young people are going to be engaged in that debate, they move mountains because there's nobody here, and I would say there's no parliamentarian and MP or senator that wants to do harm to children. I, I haven't met them. Um, everybody is on the same page, and when young people are at the center, when they're here and they're talking about what they need, people will come around. Canada will come around. And so for me, if I was you, devising a strategy on how to make that happen, I'd bring young people in, engage young people, let them engage with you in a way that brings them into that discussion, puts them at the center. I think that will move all of you to find a way to whatever the fears are, whatever the discussions are that are uniquely Canadian, we'll find a way to, to <coughs> resolve that issue because in the end, you're all on the same page. Senator Pearson, you're going to say something. We do have, you know, we do have a privacy commissioner, an ethics commissioner, official languages commissioner, and they do have mandates to make government accountable. Do you think that's the, the format that perhaps that we well, should be Well, I think, at? I mean, when I was the, the, the vice chair of the Canadian Commission for the International Year Child in 1979, so it's been even longer than the 20 years that you talked about, we recommended a responsibility center for children at the federal level because we kept seeing that children keep falling off the agenda unless there is a focus. There is no continual focus. So when I came here to the Senate, I was working with Karen Craft Sloan, who was in the House of Commons, and together we put together a proposal three times, three iterations, managed to get up actually to the Privy Council. But, you know, it's just too complicated. So the ideas are floating. I think I'd like to pick up on Irwin because I think if we get the kids involved, what we need to do is to get the process started. You don't end with the commissioner, you start with the process. But there's gotta be some commitment from the federal government that we will start a process to look at how best we can respond to and protect the rights of all the children in Canada, including Indigenous children. Okay, anybody else on the panels want to add to that? All uh, right. Senator Joyal. Thank you, merci. Uh, thank you all for your contribution. I would like to thank the former Senator Pearson. Uh, and I have, I have, in fact, three questions. Um, and I will, I will start at the point where Senator Munson has left it. My, my perception after 20 years in the Senate, and especially the fight that we had, I don't know if you remember, on the Youth Criminal Justice Act, the Minister of Justice came to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee and told us, you will remember, the act is perfect, there is no need for any change in it. And we did change in against the government will to protect the aboriginal kids, because they were not recognized the same way that the Gladue principle in the criminal code recognized that when you are from aboriginal origin, the tribunal has to take into account the special circumstances that produce the situation where you are at. 
and we reintroduced the Gladue principle in the U Criminal Justice Act in support of the abortional kids. And I remember the ear of the government in those days because we sent back the bill in the other place and they didn't want to deal with it and whatnot. My, my conclusion, of the, the con one of the conclusions of my experience of those years is that there is no children impact evaluation of bills before they come to the chamber. You know, now the government has committed on gender impact evaluation. So when the, the cabinet is seized with a proposed bill, there is an evaluation of the impact of the bill on gender parity. But there is no such evaluation on children. So let's take an example, the cannabis bill. You know, I'm looking at Mrs. Cisse. The cannabis bill will affect more kids than any other group of citizens in Canada, especially those who have mental health, you know, I would not say syndrome, but incapacity that are sometimes not even detected. Those kids, if they use cannabis, it's gonna be a nightmare. So such a bill has never had, in my opinion, we don't have it yet here in the Senate, but if we would have that instruments of a children impact evaluation on bills, well, at least we would be able to judge if the bill meets its target. And when we are reviewing it in the Senate, because we're a legislator, we would be informed of the consequences of the bill and in better position to decide if there is an amendment needed or amendments needed or not. So that's my first you know, proposal to you. Do you think that this could help uh, Mrs. Uh, Wolf to change the chart of where Canada stays at this point in time? Uh, Senator, we've only got time for one yeah. question. If you want to yeah. make the rest of it a part two and a part three, or we'll put you down for a second round if we okay. can get there. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think both both um, uh, Lisa and I can respond to that. There is an instrument that actually exists called the Child Rights Impact Assessment, and the province of New Brunswick is using it for all their legislation. So it's not that it doesn't have to be invented; it exists. And I'd like to take that recommendation on very strongly. You might have some sure. support to that, too. Yeah, we worked with um, the Child and Youth Advocate in New Brunswick and the government of New Brunswick to develop that instrument and help train the, um, the policymakers. And it's, you know, they're learning and trying it out as they're going. But I think it's a great demonstration in our federal lab. Um, you know, federalism doesn't always work extremely well for kids, but it can when you look at a, a province like that that's being so progressive and have shown that this is an instrument that is very helpful because um, what it does, it is allows you know um, the, the interests of children to be balanced against other interests. And I think the interest in doing this came from a, a decision that was made in New Brunswick that didn't achieve that balance and there was some political um, consequences. Um, but also, you know, to look at children's different rights and different groups of children. How is something going to affect different groups of children? And again, you know, at UNICEF we have a saying, there's no policy neutral issue. Um, everything affects kids and, you know, some, and so sometimes it's those issues that you don't think are going to affect kids where this is actually even more useful. Um, cannabis bill, you know, is, is one where this would be extremely helpful to balance the different aims and interests that are getting aired. Um, so, yes, happy to talk more about that anytime. Uh, Anybody else? No. Okay. S Senator Bowman. Obviously, uh, uh, societal inequities are, are very real, and uh, you've certainly challenged us to find ways to, to close the gaps between uh, Aboriginal and non Aboriginal opportunities and North and South opportunities. And uh, I want to thank you. You've all brought forward truly substantial concerns and ideas and actions. Mr. Elman, you uh, mentioned the issues resulting from children having been separated from their culture. And um, if we agree that culture is important and that the arts are a voice to society's um, soul and needs and hopes and are an essential connector for people, how do we make sure that children are linked to their rights and opportunities to arts and to cultural expression. 
there are organizations across the country like Winnipeg's Arc City, and I know there are organizations that work with theater with kids in, in, in inner city um, situations. But in my view, they're pretty few and far between. Those that exist are excellent, but, um, and they do it on a shoestring. So my concern is um, how do we ensure that access? How do we develop the partnerships between these organizations and create others so that children from the North and the South, from Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal, from rural, from inner cities, um, uh, can, can really engage with their culture, engage with that soul, and um, re thus reduce the separation uh, from their respective cultures. What, what, what needs to be done? How do we make those links? You know, I'm always thinking, oh, okay, what would young people want me to say to that and how to answer? It's not so important what I think, but what I hear they think. Yeah, so I want, I want to say this. The, uh, again, the gap between the missing culture and identity and that sense of belonging for Indigenous is, is a chasm. I want to make sure I say that it's true for many of the children in, in the country. So the key thing about that for me, the first point, I'll make it really quick, is that, you know, if we partner with, support First Nations themselves to answer that question, they have a different way, I've learned enough to know they have a different way of looking at the world than I do, than we do, than the people who are not Indigenous. And they will create new forms and ways of understanding how to answer that question that, frankly, we can use because we are boxed in by our own thinking, our way of, our way of thinking, by our own culture or lack thereof, many, many of us in the country. And so it's just obvious that as much as Indigenous people need the right to self-determination and answer that question for themselves, we need them to, because they will, they will lead us to be better practices, and we can borrow, look at, borrow, and learn ourselves. It's a partnership as much for us as it is for them. So that's the, the thing I would say about that to answer that question. We young people, the other thing they tell me, it's not... They always remind me, we go to school. Like, where is our school in helping to answer that question? And they're all there, so how do they learn what you're talking about in school? How are all those organizations that you're thinking about connected to the school where they already exist? How do we set up what you just identified as a goal within our schools? That's where they are. We have them seven hours a day. This is what they tell me. You have a seven hours a day captured in a classroom, do it. It's not rocket science, right? Make it happen. And that, from a young people, children's perspective, that's like, yeah, okay. They don't get all the complications of trying to make it happen. But that's where I think some of the answer lies. I, I'm looking at you. I don't know if you have thoughts. Uh, Senator Pearson wants to get in on this. Yeah, no, I just, I had a wonderful opportunity yesterday in Montreal where they were celebrating the uh, uh, National Child Day, uh, the greater, the foundation of Greater Montreal. There was a presentation by some kids about, and it relates to what symbols it works in, where they were using drama and, and arts to enable some of the understanding for our newcomer and refugee children. And it was, they showed it on a video, they, and they did a skit and so on. It's such a rich methodology. That was done in a school that obviously approved of it. So I think one of our challenges, it's harder for the federal government to influence the provincial government, but we can certainly provide a little bit more uh, the federal government can provide more funding for arts for kids to enable them. I mean, a much richer uh, opportunity, I think, for for uh, for schools to, to use those seven hours that we've got them. We don't use them as well as we should. The kids keep telling us that. Merci à vous deux pour cette intéressante réponse, Sénatrice 
We thank you very much uh, for that very interesting. Yes, Mr. Sinden, go ahead. Most have said as well. Um, certainly, in regards to your question, for First Nations communities in particular, that uh, aspect of self-determination is incredibly important. Um, I, we have to re remember that First Nations communities, uh, Inuit and Métis, have been taking care of their children for tens of thousands of years, and uh, they've, done, they've done so quite successfully. And uh, you know that uh, there's there's some arguments you hear about uh, capacity, and uh, um, frankly, I, I I don't buy those arguments. Uh, I I believe, and I've seen that uh, communities have the solutions. They have they have the uh, the capacity certainly to provide those those um, cultural linkages. And uh, so it's uh, from from the government's perspective, uh, we have to take a step back from telling communities what's in the best interest of their children and uh, provide the resources to partner with them so that they, they can answer that question themselves. Thank you. Thank you for this nuance. Senatrice Gagné. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your presentations. I found them all very inspiring. I'm a, an educator by background. Uh, I've worked in the uh, school system my entire life. And throughout my career, I also worked uh, diligently to ensure that our, our children and our families could have access to quality child care. And uh, I uh, stressed uh, early childhood education that it be available, uh, available in the uh, maternal language of the child. My question centers uh, on not evaluating Canada's performance and policies, uh, including uh, f financing for early childhood education. But uh, we're really quite a distance from actually arriving at uh, promoting universal access to, ch to early childhood education, diversified services, which in fact respects children and uh, offers some assurance to parents who wish to have access, uh, quality education for early childhood education. And I insist on the language, on the culturally appropriate language of the child. Do you, uh, do you find that perhaps we're underestimating the importance of child care services and the quality of life issues with the children? Um, yes, I... Je peux répondre peut-être en français. Je suis tout fait d'accord. Yes, I agree with you 100%. I find that uh, the earlier you begin, the better it is. So we have to, try, we have to begin with early childhood education. I know that the Caring Society, for example, are uh, in the process of uh, publishing a book, I believe, uh, shortly be out, which is absolutely apt for young children, allow allowing them to learn what they need to learn as to uh, th their rights, particularly Indigenous uh, children. It's, 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 it's a known fact that early childhood education, early childhood is the moment where the child is ripe developmentally for education. In the, the uh, uh, Royal Commission on the Status of Women, when they recommended in the 60s, late 60s, uh, child care, it was the first time that child care became this really big issue. Then it was being sold as <coughs> enabling women. So it was really being sold as a woman's right. It was enabling women to get mm -hmm. to work and so on. That was the big emphasis. I've been rereading re some of that. It's only been more slowly that we've understood that the right of a child to have access to the best quality, mm -hmm. universal, accessible quality, um, not, not obligatory, but accessible um, 
is something that we recognize that is for their rights and for the rights of them and their families that that, that, that early childhood um, care is important. And it's, I think, in my view, a better way to actually um, develop a broader national program than to use it as a say, well, this will help the economy. Mm -hmm. I know it's, we always talk about investment, but it's, uh, it, investment is not a rights issue. <laughs> the rights issue is the right to life and development, which is one of the fundamental principles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So I'd like people to really focus on that as a way of promoting this. And I'm hoping that there, I mean, I know there's some work in progress. It's always a work in progress. <laughs> I wish it would progress a little faster, but uh, <laughs> but it is a work in progress, and you know, hopefully we will get closer. We'll never get there entirely, but we'll get closer. Thank you for the question. Merci pour votre réponse, Senator Pearson, dans les deux langues. Thank you for that answer, uh, uh, Senator Landon, in both official languages too. We, and on the list, Senator we have Senator, Mercer. Senator Mercer and then Senator Joyelle again. Uh, but let me in, insert a couple from the audience, if I may, at this point. Uh, again, microphone number five, uh, uh, up to three minutes for questions, comments. Uh, first is uh, Kathy uh, uh, Vandergift from the uh, Canadian Coalition for the Rights of Children. Thank you. It is a privilege and honor to be with you again, and I have engaged with the Senate through previous reviews of Canada's implementation of the Convention. So in following up on the conversation about duty bearers, I would like to highlight um, a very immediate opportunity that you have as a Senate to be allies with the community here today. The officials are working right now on Canada's next report. We met with the Senate uh, following the last report. Canada received about 100 recommendations. It would be very helpful for some of you in the Senate to pick up on some of those recommendations from Canada's last review now, while we're still working on the next review, and begin to ask what has happened with the, review, with the recommendations Canada received last time. Then you could be engaged through the review, which will happen in 2018, 2019, and then follow up on the review. We, we need to make these processes more um, robust and productive in Canada, not just two days at the UN, but in Canada. And the Senate has a real opportunity right now because the review is being worked on, and we would love to work with you to pick up all the issues you've heard in a progressive way um, through that process. I think that, that could be uh, a big help. Um, so secondly, I, I just wanted to follow up on the suggestion about a CREA. We recently made a statement calling for a CREA on the legislation dealing uh, with marijuana use and highlighting all the provisions of the convention and how they might need to be considered. That could be a, a useful role on a specific bill. And third, I want to leave with you this thought. Implementing the convention can make federalism work better. And so we can take a real forward approach to it, not just a, a blaming or a guilt-shaming approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh uh, and I'll go to the second one, and then if the panelists have any response after I hear for the, the second person, then uh, on both of the presentations, then fine. Uh, so next is uh, Sarah Del Villano uh, from Citizens for Public Justice. I like to talk, so I brought my notebook <laughs> so I could stay on task. So I just want to first off thank Mark St. Denis for your testimony, I've personally witnessed um, the disproportionate application of the child welfare system in my life and it was quite a horrific experience. So I'm really appreciative of what you had to say because um, it was quite damaging. Uh, so as many of you know, Campaign 2000's annual report card on child and family poverty in Canada was released yesterday. I know Lisa, you mentioned it. Um, I'm wondering if the senators or anybody has any response 
to the fact that child poverty rates are higher than they were in 1989 when the federal government uh, committed to end child poverty, not reduce it, end it uh, by the year 2000. And also with the upcoming Canada Poverty Reduction Strategy, I'm just wondering if any of the experts around the table um, have any recommendations as to what they'd like to see embedded within that to uh, protect the rights of the child in line with the CRC. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, comments of any of the panelists to either of these two presentations? We all agree with them, right? <laughs> uh, okay, Lisa. Yes. Um, thank you for that. I just, um, just a couple of quick thoughts on the opportunities with the poverty reduction strategy. I, um, Again, I think that's one of those areas where, you know, children are poorer than the general population, which, uh, you know, at a time when deprivation really matters. And um, I think that um, it's an opportunity for the government to start um, a process of being accountable for outcomes of the, the kinds of things that are measurable for kids. Um, and it would be wonderful to see every new government um, you know, be measured against how they have reduced child poverty from the previous, uh, for one. And um, I think to add to income measures of child and family poverty, a more multidimensional approach where we can look at how children are deprived or not in other areas of their lives. This is done widely in Europe. And, um, you know, kids need more than money to get what they need. Um, they need good public services because family incomes, private, you know, incomes don't purchase um, all the good things like early child care and development. Um, so multidimensional measures can help us understand that and they can, you know, help us understand what the provinces and territories are doing together with the federal government um, in a more holistic way. So thanks. Okay, we'll come back to the audience a little bit later again, uh, uh, Sarah and Agnes, if you if you want to get on the, the list. And Senator Pate is next. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. I have a, a couple of comments, and I also want to thank in particular Senator Pearson for being one of my mentors for many, many years and um, for being uh, part of introducing me to many of these areas. So. Um, the, the comments and, and it's a combination comments and questions for all of you is um, you've all mentioned in some way involving young people and for most of my life I've worked in a context where we've involved those who are impacted by the issues that we're working on um, but many of the many of the involvements have been perfunctory if I could put it that way and and have left sometimes people in more uh, vulnerable positions because there's um, they have opportunities that are short-lived, and we don't actually make the big leap to fundamentally change their reality on the ground, whether it's young people, women, um, indigenous uh, people, and on and on. And it strikes me that uh, as we're looking at some of these issues, um, many, many of you have talked about, but the really the need to look at the intersectional approach of the, the groups that are most marginalized who are part of our responsibility, our collective responsibility as a Senate. Those who are poor, those who are racially or culturally marginalized, those who are economically marginalized, those who are marginalized because of age or because of um, gender. And so um, it strikes me that the, the inadequacy of really those analyses and how we work together, um, because most of those groups all lack voices everywhere, and so we tend to see them develop in, um, I hate the term silos, but really in, in we, we have categories. And it strikes me in this area for youth, it is another one of those, and I'm glad people that you've mentioned, uh, Senator Joelle did and Senator Pearson, the Youth Criminal Justice Act, because it strikes me when we look at what's happened to young women um, under that legislation, even though there's been some very progressive changes, as we're sitting here now, 43% or more of the young women in custody are indigenous young women. And I think that epitomizes the discriminatory impact and the, the effect in the end. And so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm concerned about how we address that because um, while I agree I don't want to come down to dollar issues, as Senator Pearson just said, the reality is it is a case of pay now or pay later. And we're spending an awful lot of resources 
on the back end of people when, you know, whether it's the missing and murdered Indigenous women or um, over the fastest growing population of those who are jailed are both young and adult women. Um, when we see all of that, it strikes me that we have some, and you know, of course, the First Nations Caring Society, the links that have been made in terms of the inadequacy of childcare, of um, healthcare, of education for those who are most marginalized. And so it strikes me that part of it is we need to be demanding different policy decisions across sectors that isn't just uh, starting with a youth impact analysis, but saying an equality impact analysis needs to be taken to. Um, demand that those policy be decisions be taken in different ways. So um, it, it's a comment and a, a bit of a question. I'm, I don't just want to say, do you agree? Uh, but <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you've all thought about how we actually achieve that. And I'm interested in how you see us achieving that because you've all posed similar questions. I think you're amongst friends in terms of, uh, and allies in terms of agreeing with these issues. And how do we actually move that forward collectively? Is it something the Senate just ne needs to take a lead on? And because the, we can't rely on the elected a house to actually do that because you won't see the change in the time of an elector, you know, the electoral period, and so it requires that a concerted effort be taken by the Senate. So, comments, uh, uh, uh It's a very good question, and so that's if the Senate is interested in moving forward around some of those ideas about how to involve children or young people, and I say both, those, that's a key question. So one of the things to consider, and, and I think about it, is that anything you do with young people, one of your its primary goals will be to do no harm. So however you engage with young people, you do no harm. And so it forces you to think about the questions you've asked. So one of the thoughts you would say, I think, would be, whichever young people happen to be involved with us, they will be stronger for being involved with us when we're, they're finished than when they begin. That's a principle you can enact for those young people or children. You would always want to report back to them in respect because they're working with you. It's not a necessarily a one-shot deal. You'd want to make sure that they have the supports they need in order to participate. You'd want to make sure that they are part of the discussions about the form in which they participate because it needs to be safe and comfortable for them. You would put yourself probably in situations where it's not as safe and comfortable for you. That's okay. You have more resources than they do, especially the young people we're talking about. You have more resources than they do right now to manage that. I think that, again, one of the ways in which you could think about your work, and it's a bigger discussion, is to about to instigate to be an agent of change yourself. So the way in which you do things will create change. I met with, um, say, the Minister of, of Education Ontario, um, who said, oh, it would be so refreshing to hear from young people. I need to hear from young people. And I reminded her, Minister, you can go to any school in the province in any day, walk into a classroom and say, I'm here, what do I need to know? To students, it's, it's possible. I remember that I was in a school um, in Toronto National Child Day, and I remember the teachers saying, oh, it's so refreshing to hear from our kids, right? Because we had this forum, right? And I was thinking, the teacher hears from the children every single day. Social workers, and thank you for the person from the audience who, who mentioned her own experience, but social workers in child welfare have said the same thing. What a refreshing experience to hear from kids in the system when they hear from the kids in the system on their caseload every day. It's about us changing our ways of understanding, right? If, we, if you said, you know what we're gonna do? We have areas we come from, we have homes, we're going to go to a school ourselves. I'm going to go to a classroom ourselves and say, we're considering this bill. Can we come and ask the students what we think? Now you're in a situation where at least those kids in that classroom or in the whole group home or wherever 
what you're considering is affecting them, have supposed supports in place. Like that's a protective factor and a group. And you have a chance of leaving them stronger than when you came. I will say this, that this listening tour, and I mentioned it, young people are feeling like uh, we've been asked. Like, we need a little adult help here in making the change. And that's, that's where I think the tiring part is. So if you're going to involve young people, which I hope you do, and children too, because they have a voice, and young people who can't speak. I know Senator Munson knows this group of young people with, with disabilities. They have a voice too. If you're going to engage all children and young people, then you have to do it um, as seriously as they're going to come to the table, which means you're going to do something with their words. And so that's a commitment I think you, you need to make to yourselves and to young people in doing that. Senator Pearson and then uh, Mr. St. Uh, thank you, Senator Pate, for your question. I, and I also to the audience as well. I think that what we're looking at and have to look at constantly is what I look at is that systemic change that's necessary. The devil is in the details. I mean, I heard the other day that, you know, yes, we've augmented the child tax benefit, but if you're a child in the welfare system, particularly if you're an indigenous child in the wel child welfare system, the money, I, I said, where does the money go? Does it go with the child? No, it goes to the, the, child, the child's guardians in the welfare system, and then they decide what to do with it. So that's where the devil is in the details. The systems do not uh, form themselves along the rights of the child. They form themselves along the rights of others, if I may say so. And so one of the challenges with every program and policy, if you look at a child rights impact assessment or something of that sort, is how does it work out in detail? How, those are the main problems, colonization, is still there because of the mindset that set up all these systems, which in fact are not responsive to the rights of children. And those are the systems that we, we need to shift and push at and, and you know, hear from the kid who says, as Erwin has asked them, well, what do you want? What kind of change do you want? Well, they'll tell you, and then we've got to figure out how to do it. Sorry. <laughs> Sam Davis. Thank you. Um, so in terms of a very real opportunity upcoming to listen to children and youth and what they have to say about these issues, in particular about uh, the First Nations and Inuit and Métis, um, on February 15th, we have an event on Parliament Hill, the Caring Society organizes called Have a Heart Day. And um, it's youth run, it's youth led. We just provide, the, I guess, the administrative services to help them get going. And uh, so we have no idea what they're going to be saying, but usually there's about uh, 700 children who show up on Parliament Hill and they have speeches, they read poems, and they present their, their ideas for a better future. And so uh, they, I know they would be um, happy, more than happy if, if the senators uh, would show up and be there and listen and to hear them and hear what they have to say. And uh, I, I know it would also be very um, exciting for them if they had uh, some sort of response as well, to know that they didn't just show up on the hill and, and said their words to deaf ears, but they were heard. That would be very powerful. So that's a, that's a good opportunity coming up to, to hear the children speak. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. La prochaine sénatrice qui prendra. Thank you. The next uh, senator to join in this uh, discussion, who was the vice president, vice chair of uh, the Quebec Organization for uh, Human Rights, is um, Senator Dupuis. My question is addressed uh, more specifically to uh, Senator Pearson. Of course, the, the other guests are quite invited to come and. Uh, join in, and I want to thank this lady here for the question that she had, uh, giving us some concrete ideas on how we might advance uh, the cause. As you said, Senator, the rights of the child. What strikes us is in this country, we're 
we're quite un, we're, we're quite fast in, in understanding the perspective and point of view of mining companies, for example. Uh, we understand that instantly, but it's very difficult to understand, apparently, uh, the rights of the indigenous people, the rights of the child, or the rights of women. So my, my, my question, general scope, we, listening to you today, it's fine, but we have a lot of offices here, and uh, each of you has given concrete examples, excellent examples, to help us to understand and helps us to establish relationships with children with young people we're adults and we haven't yet found the, the the hook the handle the way to just arrive at a more equitable and just society for children so a general comment and i want to thank you senator pearson you said that <clears throat> what we have to deal with if we is our systemic changes systemic changes to overcome these problems, and the Senate must find ways, something concrete, something practical, and we're having difficulty doing that, to integrate into our very daily business, into the institution of the Senate, ways and means of correcting systemically this situation. Well, thank you very much for uh, the generous comments. I, I would agree, of course, we have to find the ways to do it. But I really don't know if it will be possible. And I've often given it a lot of thought while I was here. Uh, we had a small caucus that used to deal with uh, children's issues. Uh, at the time, it was... Uh, uh, with our colleagues from the other place, as we call it. But um, it was a joint committee, and when we worked on those, or caucus, I should say, and when we worked on those issues, whenever we got down to a work plan, we'd have to narrow it down to one tiny little point. It was the... Uh, extending uh, parental uh, holidays or maternity leave or such. And it's all very well to receive reports from experts and uh, uh, have discussions with ministers and uh, uh, always ending up with the Minister of Finance, of course. But... Um, over all that time, with all that effort, we were unable to change the system. We took one item in the system, one one little thing, uh, maternity leave, let's say, and we were able to change that. But I don't know what kind of impact that would have on the system. Uh, well, we changed one item. We have to go beyond that. We have to... Uh, and yet, the Senate is a powerful institution. You can uh, invite witnesses, uh, any... Any Mandarin in town, uh, ministers? Uh, and even if you don't result with a report and recommendations, it might still be a way of uh, stimulating or... I, I recall at one point we were looking at the Youth Justice uh, Act And we were at odds with an issue that wasn't in the text of the law, not the, not the wording, but the implementation measures. So, uh, we were told about uh, children or youth that had had many problems in their dealings with the justice system. Um, I'm, I'm even looking for the word in English right now, but uh, individuals who have been apprehended, they were being held in custody. Because the, the corrections officer didn't want to touch them in case they might get uh, accused. So they put this horrible machine that, was, that came out of Texas <laughs> where you could put the young person, the young girl, and sort of bind her in like a chair and then drag her along so you weren't touching and therefore you were, see what I mean? This is a question of the devils in the details. As a result of that, we had a change made. We in the Senate 
had a change made. Justice Department was very responsive. There was a change made in those, those regulations that went with the act. You have the power to do that. Okay, we're down to our last 10 minutes. So uh, and we've got a couple of people, uh, um, a couple of senators on the list, uh, Mercer and Cordy. I have two, as well as I was hoping to get to a second round for uh, Senator Joyel. Uh, and I do have two more people uh, in the audience. If I could uh, ask the people in the audience to just, we'll hold back the panelists until I get everybody's questions or comments. Uh, but let me ask, first of all, for, for one minute each from uh, Mary Ellen Rayner, Sandbach Project, first. Good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to make a comment uh, this morning. Um, on the topic of involving youth, um, I'd like to share some, quickly share some news with you on behalf of our Youth Council, the Young Canadians Roundtable on Health. Uh, they launched a new rights campaign on Monday called youthhealthrights.ca. Um, this originated entirely with our youth. Uh, they got together and they said that when it comes to health, they said, we don't know what our rights are. Um, so this campaign, is an online advocacy and education project, and it's based around three priorities that uh, young people from across Canada want to bring to Canada's leaders. Uh, number one, greater awareness of their rights. Number two, increased youth voice in health decision making. Uh, and number three, shorter wait times for mental health services. So I invite you to take a look at their project. And again, that address is youthhealthrights.ca. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, uh, from the audience, uh, Mark uh, Rensinger. President of the Canadian Teacher Federation. Well, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here today. Uh, the topic that we see, we, we see in our classrooms across the country every year. Uh, frankly speaking, when we're talking about, about hungry children and combining their basic needs prior to actually having to meet their academic needs puts a great deal of pressure on education systems across the country. I'm often struck by the, the commentary that says children belong to us all, but I consider that sometimes political speak for it doesn't belong, they don't belong to anybody. It's a way to, to, to move on the issues and, and get it on to the next individuals to, to go. Since 1989, we've talked to, and I've heard that uh, there's a call to end child poverty, look at child needs. Since that time, two generations of children have gone through and completed their schooling. What we do know as educators is that poverty does not stop. Children don't stop and we can't stop their educational needs because they come to school without their basic needs being met. When I use examples like that, if I was in a sarcastic mood, I've often talked about geologic time versus government action and it's a question of which is sometimes slower. But what I would say is from the discussion that I've heard today as senators, I've heard about the call to hear children, uh, hear their voice. You've got easy access to children every day, but don't ask what you're not willing to hear. And if there is no action that is on the horizon, don't ask for it. Because it's a travesty to represent change and ask for a voice and ask for realities and then take that hope away because nothing is forthcoming, because we as adults can't get it together. Children are the future of our country and they deserve a concerted effort that goes across political lines. And that's why this discussion is important to me today, because political lines are not the issue here. It's the problem of supporting our future generations, to me, that becomes the issue. And it behooves us to take action as opposed to just simply talking. Thank you. Thank you, excellent point. Okay, very quickly, let me get the, the two uh, senators we have on the list. We, we do have to leave it 11.15 uh, because a number of senators have a, another session to go to. Uh, so Senator Mercer and Senator Cordy, if you could put your questions and then we'll come back to the panel to finish off both it, from it, the audience uh, submissions as well as yours. Uh, thank you, Chairs, and uh, I appreciate the, the quality of the debate this morning. I, I, uh, interesting, following the president of the National Federation of Teach, uh, Teachers Federation, uh, I wanted to ask an education question. In, in, at the provincial level in many provinces now, uh, how education is being delivered to younger Canadians is changing. 
for example, in, in Center Court in my province in Nova Scotia, we have, this is our first year where we've moved to a pre-kindergarten uh, age four schooling. I, I, what I, my question to the panel is, is, does this present us with an opportunity uh, to, to help solve some of the problems that we've talked about? It's been championed by the provincial government and by other, other groups as, as a liberator of the, of the stay-at-home parent, whichever parent that might be, or also a liberator of, of, uh, of, of the cash that must be spent for child care. Now that the child is no longer in, in, in the full-time child care, they're, they, they're now in school for part of that. Uh, is this an opportunity that we need to, to think about how we capitalize on that and, and, and how, how it may be a, an opportunity to fix a little earlier some of the problems we have discussed? Senator Cordy. Uh, thank you very much. And going back to the previous comments about don't ask what you're not willing to hear, I think that's extremely important. We can't just pretend that we're listening when we're really not. And the reason that I love speaking to children and going to schools is because they tend not to have the filter that adults have. So you're going to hear exactly what's on their mind and, and you should be listening. We should be listening. Um, going back to Senator Bovey's comments about the importance of the arts and, and Senator Pearson also went on to talk about her experiences in Montreal. The sad reality is that in times of economic hardships, the first programs to be cut in the school systems are the music programs, the art programs, the physical education programs. And these are programs that often provide children with their best successes. They may find the academia challenging, but they're great at sports, or they're great at art, or they're great at drama, and yet these are what are cut back. And, and these are the programs that provide a physical, a great uh, res responses for the children, but also I think they provide uh, help with mental health challenges that young children might have. So my question is, goes back to comments, Mr. Uh, Ms. Sisak, you spoke for the need for investment in mental health services. Uh, Mr. St. Dennis, you spoke about no one should have to recover from their childhood. And Mr. Elman, you spoke about the sense of belonging, because if children don't feel they belong, it's quite likely they're not going to have good mental health. So I think the Senate has shown leadership in mental health for adults when we've talked about uh, when we did the study on the Social Affairs Committee, which uh, I think did a lot going toward um, reducing the stigma of mental health. So what should the Senate do in terms of children and youth mental health? Because I think we can show leadership in that area. Okay, so the last four uh, questions, uh, panelists, uh, who wants to start? Okay, we'll start with Sybil. I'd love to start, thank you. Um, I think one of the approaches um, that can be effective is to look at um, communities that are having success when it comes to mental health. And I spoke in my presentation about um, Indigenous communities having a very high suicide rate. But certainly we know there are Indigenous communities that have very low rates of suicide and even some that have no suicides. Um, and so researchers are now starting to s are unpack why that might be. Um, and in talking about sort of the importance of culture, language, music, and the arts, um, one of the things that they're finding is that um, where communities have a certain level of self-determination and where the youth in the community speak, um, you know, at least 50% of them are speaking uh, their own native language, they feel much a much greater sense of belonging. And those are the communities that are actually much healthier. Um, and so I do think that we need to um, take a strength-based approach um, in thinking about some of these things. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, just... Uh, Maybe a way of answering a bit of both questions is, um, you know, again, our research on how Canada is a pretty unequal society and some of the, um, the competition and um, fear that that creates among, you know, among parents um, to channel their kids into things that are not the arts, into the STEM, into, you know, financially competitive um, pursuits also plays out in early years programming when it's a little more academic focused and less play based. I mean, these are some of the dynamics really creating a lot of pressures in our society to do the things that we are doing that aren't working so well. So um, I would say, you know, yes, I mean, children's rights is about honoring, you know, the, the, um, the talents that are within each child and recognizing and nourishing that. It makes it more difficult to do in a, an unequal society. Um, and Absolutely, we need you know child care that is of good quality universally, you know, from the time that um, 
mothers are, are going back to the workforce, and certainly by age three for those who are not, it's pretty clear um, those good quality services work against inequality, as long as, again, they're play-based and honoring the, you know, the full developmental opportunities of every child. Senator Pearson. Yeah, just a quick answer to Senator Mercer about early childhood, the four great, it is an opportunity. It's an opportunity, though, it can go both ways. The real thing to remember is that four-year-olds learn best through play. Play is what, what enables that imagination, nourishes that imagination, enables them to imagine other possibilities that life can have more than one. So I think you have to keep an eye as we put these programs, which are going to be helpful in the sense of liberating, you know, mothers and enable people to go back to work, all that kind of stuff. Play is what's uh, essential that it be in there and that the people who come in to work with those kids understand the, the absolutely essential role of play. Of course, we all should. We should go on playing till the end of our lives. <laughs> Erwin, just really quickly, and it's not to, to answer the question, I, I just want to say thank you to the Sen again and thanks for the invitation and then say to you, you're not alone. Like, if I can encourage you to take a step, somebody, but together, take a step. Reach, we're with you, right? We want to make you successful in how to involve young people, answer those questions. Reach out to us and engage us in helping you if you, if you want to take that step, because you don't have to let this open caucus be the, the last sentence in, in the book. I mean, we, this can be the first sentence in the paragraph, and we're here for you. <laughs> uh, I, I know, I'm looking at the people here, I'm not necessarily speaking from by, I know that we are, you're not alone in this work, and we wanna be with you. Okay, well, that's it. Uh, terrific panel, <laughs> we've learned a lot, and I think uh, your comments, uh, Erwin, are, are good ones to close on, because uh, we now have an opportunity to think about how we can move this forward. We're reconstituting our committees, so we have opportunities there for uh, moving some parts of this agenda forward. Uh, closing comments, uh, Raymond? We started out by saying it was important to listen to children. I think we've been given a number of uh, optional avenues to explore today and how we might follow up. And it will just uh, mark uh, how serious we are that we do follow up. There's no issue as to the uh, will of our senators uh, the, to, be, to mobilize behind these issues. All the feedback I get from my fellow senators uh, just reassure me that there will be a follow-up, or, or follow-ups in the plural. And Mr. Sidney has said, uh, and Senator Cordy cited it as well, saying that no child should have to recover from their childhood. Now, if we start with that in mind, perhaps with the assistance and help and support of adults, we can help that child be a happy person and become a happy, accomplished uh, adult individual. I think we will have succeeded. I think it's a heck of a challenge, and uh, I, I think we're, we could be up to it. I thank the panelists, I thank the audience that had questions, and, and the senators. Thank you. Uh, meeting uh, of Open Caucus until uh, after the Christmas break. Uh, but I want to point out that the person that has organized this for more than a year now, uh, help to bring the panels together and the framing of the different subjects together is leaving us. That's Agnes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, she's going on to uh, do full time on her uh, thesis, her master's thesis. And so uh, thank you to Agnes for all your service uh, for the Open Caucus. And the lady beside you is Sarah. She's going to take over. So in the new year, yeah. she'll be uh, she'll be. So thank you very much to both of you. And and this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>